This episode is brought to you by Kim and Leo, Todd, Jeff S., Dave, and Jeff B., this week's newest patrons. So you want to go cruising, you're retired or maybe just tired. It's time to shove off from the land life of the regular folks and have some worldly adventures. Maybe see some places you've never seen in tropical paradises and drink slushy rum drinks on white sandy beaches in gin clear water. You want to meet people who've lived their lives in the islands, maybe take up fishing and even plan on playing the guitar or the ukulele while you listen to Jimmy Buffett or Kenny Chesney play in the background while the old salts tell all the old stories around the beach campfire. Once that sailing bug bites you, all you can think about is sort of like buying a sailboat. I've seen it so many times with so many people. They go sailing once and boom, they're hooked. They have to buy a sailboat. And once the other bug bites you, the live aboard cruising bug, land life finally has an expiry date and you start counting down the days until you can finally set loose the dock lines and sail away. Now it all sounds very romantic, and if you're watching this channel, you probably already have that bug, but before you can untie those lines, you have to figure out which boat to buy, which boat makes the most sense, which boat can you actually afford, and what are other people using to do this, because why invent the wheel, right? Now, we started this series to try and answer those questions, and we're finally at the big fat round number that many of us have in our budget for just such a boat. We started here at 20 grand, and boom, we're already here. I seriously can't wait to see what we're going to find. This week on Everything You Need to Know, the $100,000 sailboat. Now we started doing these episodes at a really interesting time in the sailboat market because like the housing market, it was red hot, but it's been cooling down over the summer as prices got cheaper and cheaper. And what we found was that we kind of have two options when it comes to a cruising boat. Now we've started to see some genuine potential from the production style boats for under a hundred grand, which I didn't actually expect to see that cheap. I thought we wouldn't see the floating condos until about 150 grand, but last week we found something like a really nice Hunter 430. The alternative we found to production style boats were the older, heavy, sort of long distance cruisers, things like the West Sail 42, which I sort of did expect to find. And $100,000 is kind of no different. If you want a full keel, heavy girl to keep you super comfortable and safe, then we're going to start today with this. This is a Sea Star 46, and we've had sort of an effort to keep it below 50 feet, so this Sea Star falls right in the right length. But you might be thinking, Tim, I've never heard of Sea Star. What is that? And that's okay. It usually isn't called a Sea Star at all. And this is one of those weird boats with many identities. This 46 was originally built in Taiwan, where a lot of these sort of heavy cruisers come from, and was also known as the Pan Oceanic 46. But it's okay if you've never heard it by that name either. The name you've likely heard this boat referred to is as the Brewer 46. And under that name, she's a Ted Brewer boat. Ted Brewer is one of the greats in the yacht design world. You've probably heard of him. He actually got his start. He cut his teeth designing with Cuthbertson of C&C Yachts. Ted was Canadian born, actually not far from me, in Hamilton, Ontario in 1933, and he started his career when he joined the Canadian Army, but he eventually retired to chase his first love, sailboats. Many very, very capable world cruisers came from Ted Brewer's pen and paper, and this is one of them. This is a cutter, so you get the big Genoa on the forestay, but you also get a baby stay behind that with yet another jib or an option to run multiple jibs. After that, she's a traditional sloop and a traditional aft cockpit, but it's under the waterline where this boat sort of makes its point. At over 33,000 pounds, this boat sports a monster of a full keel all the way back to the protected rudder. And like most of these Taiwan boats, she's laid up heavier than I feel after a McDonald's. And she's heavy for a good reason. She is jam packed with tankage. This ridiculous 80 horsepower diesel, which is probably overkill, is fed from a fuel tank equally overkill of 240 gallons. And at today's prices, that would be about $1,000 worth of diesel. 
That's the power territory, and if the fuel isn't enough to keep her heavy and settled in a rough sea, the freshwater tankage is an even more life-sustaining 300 gallons, or 1,136 liters, if you're from somewhere that sells milk in a bag. Inside this canoe-sterned monster, and yes, it is canoe-sterned, and that was a design to make it more kindly in a following sea. Inside, you'll find an extra helm, in case you forgot yours outside. And I actually spy a Victron battery monitor um, in there, so I get the impression someone might have been updating the electronics to this clever new technology. That's a $300 upgrade. But then I get to this next picture, where what I can see, I think, is a Loran. Side note. I know what this is because my boat came with it. LORAN stands for Long Range Navigation, and it was developed by the US in World War II to help ships cross the Atlantic. Its range was about 1,500 miles, with an accuracy of about 10 miles, give or take. And in a world without GPS, those numbers are absolutely amazing. The cost of LORAN sort of limited it, uh, like AIS was in the beginning, to mostly military use or heavy commercial ships, but occasionally you did find it in smaller vessels. I looked it up because my boat came with it, and it was actually a $7,000 option on my Hughes that the owner paid for back in 1980 when she was built seven grand. Now, that was probably not money well spent with whoever bought my boat originally because North America started scrapping the Loran infrastructure in the early 1980s right after my boat was built. Uh, so bad deal there. And I think Japan was the second last to scrap it in 1997. And rumor is China dropped it in 2000. So the infrastructure is gone. These things don't work anymore. Anyway, back to our Sea Star slash Pan Oceanic slash Brewer 46. This is an amazing boat. Inside, you get everything you'd expect in a 1980s sort of full displacement, ultra long distance cruiser. You get lots of nice wood finish, very craftsmanship like boat a galley style galley so you can actually brace yourself while you cook in just about any sea state that you want and you get some very roomy cabins i think to buy one of these 1980s full displacement boats you really have to be looking for just this sort of thing you want an extremely heavy ocean going sailboat that is tough as nails and very comfortable when things get rough but you also want the old world reliability of a cutter rig with loads and loads of sail options and something that just looks and feels a bit more traditional. Now the downside of course here is the age of these boats. You'll most certainly need a very good surveyor, but you'll have to find the right surveyor to do it. I suspect most of the younger generation of surveyors have probably never even seen one of these things. Now you also might find yourself needing to insure this boat, and that may prove difficult. With its age and its perceived value, most insurance companies are not going to want to take on a vessel like this. But she is a world cruiser, and she definitely looks the part. So far in these episodes, we've really only looked at sort of the older heavy displacement cruisers that we've seen a lot of for sub $100,000, and then we started to see newer style production boats show up at about eighty grand through till now. Um, but coming soon, we're going to have to deal with multi hulls. And granted, at a hundred grand, we shouldn't be expecting much or seeing anything really worth looking at. But it bears mentioning this one. This is a Privilege 45 catamaran, and you might be thinking, why in the world is this cat priced so low? Well, it's based on condition, and this one needs a lot of work, at very least a full bottom job. And it looks to be kind of the worst bottom I've ever seen. I kind of wonder where the props are. This is going to be costly. Now, that's not to be said that this can't be done. The easy way to get a 45-foot cat to go cruising on is to spend 250 grand. But it doesn't have to be the only way to get a 45-foot cat. If you pick this thing up, you get an owner's version boat, which means it's not four tiny cabins, it's probably two large ones, which is kind of ideal. And you get the space and speed and stability you want in a catamaran. But in this one, you get the work. So if you want a huge project to, say, spend a few years on, I think this one is probably worth it because in the end, you're going to have that quarter million dollar multi-hull that maybe you can't afford to buy outright, but for most of us, a hundred grand just isn't where you buy a cat. Next up on the list is actually our first appearance of Do Four Yachts, which is a brand that gets lumped in with Beneteau and Hunter, and with that gets a lot of that hate for being a 
cheaply made production boat. And I've heard a lot of bad about Dew Four. It's kind of like the European version of Hunter as far as reputation goes. Dufour was founded in France in 1964 by a naval architect named Michel Dufour and since has been building hundreds and hundreds of different sort of boats aimed at the cruising lifestyle. And if you've ever been in a sailboat show like Annapolis, you've undoubtedly been on a Dufour. They have huge exhibits at all the shows. Now you might be quick to mistake this Dufour 44 for a Catalina 42, and you really wouldn't be wrong for doing that. It looks a lot like a Catalina, and it's kind of hard to see the difference. I think there might have been some copying happening. And this model is the three cabin, two head layout that was most likely aimed to be a charter boat, but the broker doesn't give us any history. In fact, they really don't tell us anything. So I did some research on this boat to find out why we're seeing one for a hundred grand with little to no information. And I found that most of this model usually sell for about 125,000. So this one might just be a fluke, but it is worth to take, taking a look at um, because you can pick it up much cheaper than the other examples. Just make sure you find a good surveyor. Lady K Sailing is brought to you by patrons, people who give a couple of bucks an episode to make this whole channel possible. Thank you so much to all the Lady K patrons who have brought us this far and continue to support the channel. Uh, if you'd like to help out, please consider becoming a patron. Next up, we have a boat with some serious wow factor, and it's within driving distance from where I live, and it's in fresh water, which is kind of a big perk. It's not going to have all the corrosion you'd expect from sort of an East Coast or a West Coast boat. And if you want to drop a hundred grand on something big and heavy that you can live on in the lap of luxury right now today, I give you the Oceanus 44 center cockpit. And yes, this ain't your dock neighbor's floating condo standard Beneteau. This is the center cockpit world cruiser. That's what this boat was designed to do. This thing is like what happens when someone over at Beneteau sees a drawing of an Amel and decides to uh, copy it you get this massive and modern style inside with a luxurious layout and room like a 50 footer and it somehow avoids that center cockpit interior problem where they're usually like really dark and cramped somehow despite their size this boat is an exceptional option of a cruising boat the 44 is almost 25,000 pounds but it draws less than six feet of water so you can get through the bahamas without issue she carries 95 gallons of diesel and 163 gallons of fresh water to keep you alive while you travel. Honestly, the only downside to this boat I can see is the beam. If you want to keep it in little mom and pop marinas, at 14 feet, she would probably just barely fit in the widest slips like at my club. We've got one slip that's that wide. The width is seriously in the island packet territory. But if you're in the market for something like this, you really cannot sleep on this boat at this price. These are the center cockpits anyway. They're very, very rare. They don't come up for sale very often. There's not very many of them out there. So if you want to look at it, you need to book a flight to Ohio right now and go look at this thing. I'll meet you there. Now we can look at $100,000 boats all day. And you know, we probably should make a part two of this price point because I am loving the selection. And there's so many great choices for us to talk about. But let me leave you with this for today. I think the quintessential $100,000 boat has to be this next boat. If you want a more modern style of boat that gives you loads and loads of room and comfort, but sails like a champ and is built for this sort of lifestyle, you have some choices. But if it also needs to be small enough that you can single-handed or step the mast yourself on a canal, and cheap enough for a normal person to be able to afford it, there really is only one staple here, and it's come up before. This then is the Catalina 42 Mark II, and it's been showing up more and more as we get higher and higher in the price point, and for some very, very good reasons. Now, I'm not gonna bore you with all the details um, because we've talked about it before, but this boat is aimed squarely at the retiring couple who wants to go to the Caribbean. You get the ease of access that you need. You get the sugar scoop with the walk-through transom, leading to a huge but safe and comfortable cockpit, and a cabin that feels more like a downtown condo than a sailboat. It's light and it's airy and nothing feels cheap. It's all very nicely done. And I can tell you firsthand 
They sail very, very nicely. They're fast enough to sort of keep the racer in you happy, and they're well-mannered and balanced enough that the autopilot can handle it when you get tired of helming. And I've been in these boats. I've been in probably 10 versions of this boat. The Mark II really is the $100,000 cruising boat. It's the yardstick to which you can measure all other boats in this price point. Everything I see here, I think to myself, yes, but how does it compare to the Catalina? There are so many of these Mark IIs down in the islands right now that you'll always be able to find help if you have an issue because someone's probably already had that issue. And it also means that there's lots of these that are for sale and already outfitted with things like solar panels and water makers, dinghy davits, and everything else that you won't have to buy if you buy one of these. Now, I see these things all over Florida and the East Coast, and I even see them up here in the Great Lakes, and they are all new enough that they're ready to go or ready to be outfitted to go, and I've never seen one in bad shape. Every time I'm in one of these boats, I sort of look around and say, this is it. Why isn't every boat this boat? Next week, we'll be back with another installment because honestly, this price point I'm so excited about it. It just has so much to offer. If you like this episode, please feel free to feed the algorithm with a thumbs up. And if you want to see more of Lady K Sailing, don't forget to subscribe. I will see you guys next week. Mm -hmm.